Good evening, everyone. Welcome. It's great to see you all on a chilly January evening. Pretty dark here in Maine. I don't know where you all are, but I hope you have some sunlight. <laughs> Hello. All right. We are just letting folks in. We'll get things underway here in just a moment. We are very excited to welcome you all to our 2024 Art Meet Science series. And um, we have a great presentation. Dr. Haller has prepared a great presentation for you this evening, and we're excited to get started. So let's see, we've got a few more folks that are just joining us. So we'll give it a minute and then we'll get things underway. All right. So I think most of you know that the MDI Biological Laboratory has had a long interest in art and science. And Dr. Haller, who is president of the laboratory, shares that passion. And so he has really put together an amazing uh, program around art and science and one that is really designed to take a look at um, both in a historical context, the um, you know, the idea of, of similarities between art and science and how that is represented in art, but also in more in more of a contemporary context, we are expanding our uh, programming around uh, visualization of science and working directly with artists and residents who are assisting us in communicating um, scientific concepts and asking important questions and how we wrestle with some of those things. So tonight, as we think about um, our programming for 2024, we're very excited to have Dr. Herman Haller with us, who I think many of you know is um, a physician scientist, a nephrologist, as an, an exceptional uh, researcher in kidney disease around uh, related disorders, but he's also very passionate about our history. So tonight we're going to learn about Matthias Grunwald and the Eisenheim altarpiece. So Dr. Haller, thank you so much for being with us tonight and sharing um, this exciting piece of work with us. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, Cherry, for the introduction. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, as Cherry already mentioned, it's dark outside and uh, the lights are on. I think I hope you're all well. You're having a glass of wine or a cup of tea or whatever with you. And um, then we'll start a journey which will lead us from northeastern Maine back to Europe and to the Isenheim altar piece. Now, if I can move this here, this is the first view um, you will have on the Isenheim altar piece. Uh, you're lucky. Uh, it's a beautiful Easter Sunday and the altar is open because as you will see in a minute, this is more a machine putting pictures together. It's more like a video screen. And uh, this, as I said, is the second opening. So the title is slightly different. It's on the science of the Isenheim altar piece by Grunewald in 1516. Uh, it's on ischemia and hallucinations. And I'll tell you in a minute why this is. As Sherry also mentioned, we are, I am combining art history and science, art history and medicine. And uh, let's embark together on this journey. Now, where are we? We are in Colmar. Colmar is a provincial town in Alsace. Uh, this is uh, in the south of Germany or the east of France. This is near Strasbourg, and here you see a little bit what it looks like. It's a beautiful town. Uh, you have lots of wonderful shops, restaurants. You can sit on the water. And there is a lot of art. And there is a famous museum, which is called the Musée Dunter Linden. Colmar is a very special place between France and Germany. As you know, this is the Rhine Valley. This area went back and forth between 
Germany and France. And the piece of art we are discussing went back and forth between Germany and France. And uh, the French consider it a very important piece of art. And the Germans, as you'll see in a moment, also considered it something like a national treasure. So <clears throat> when we now go into the museum and uh, part of the old church is uh, now part of the museum, here you see Matthias Grunewald, born in 1475, <clears throat> died in 1528, and this is the Isenheim altar piece. That's the first view now. You've already seen the second one. So this is what it looks normally. And you can see that it's huge. It's very impressive. And as I mentioned before, it has been considered, especially at times when it left Germany and went back to France, like after the First World War, as a national treasure. During the First World War, it uh, was on exhibition in Munich. And in, in uh, 1919, it went back to France together with Alsace. And uh, this was considered to be a national tragedy. But at the same time, there was a lot of discussion about the painting because you can already see here, without any magnification, how expressive the altar is. You know, when you look at the hands of uh, Jesus Christ on the cross, this is really expressionism. And the expressionist and so nationalist feelings in Germany and modern painting expressionism came together. And uh, this made this piece of art very famous in the beginning of the 20th century. The altar is youth. You see it here in his former state before the French Revolution. It was taken apart during the French Revolution and was hidden nearby. And uh, the part which you see on top of the altar uh, went during that time. But still today, it's huge. It is more than 10 feet high, just the paintings. And it's more than 15 feet wide. So it is a huge machine. It's a big machine of images and imagination because it's not only huge and we have different paintings there, uh, you can open it and you can open it two times. So you can actually use it as a machine of images and imagination and it was used at the time for that. So when the public on big occasions like Easter and Christmas, we're sitting in church, it was opened and then a new movie started to run in the church. So it was used for different occasions and we'll talk about how and what the altar was used for. And uh, you will see that it was used quite a lot and there were different meanings to the altar, and we'll talk about that. It raises immediately the question, who did this, who was responsible for the program? But first, let's have a look at the different movies, so to speak, uh, the different paintings of the altar. As I mentioned, this is the normal appearance. You can see on the outer wings, uh, two saints. On the left-hand side, you see Saint Sebastian. And on the right-hand side, you see Saint Anthony. And Saint Anthony is the hero of our talk, as you'll learn during the next hour. In the middle, we have Jesus Christ on the cross. And on the left-hand side, we have John uh, and uh, Mary. And we have St. Madeline, and she's praying there, and there's a little char standing next to her. And on the right-hand side, we have John the Baptist and the Lamb. 
it's immediately, even on first glance, about disease and suffering. It's about suffering because Christ is obviously suffering. And when you look at the uh, hands, I already mentioned, but even more so when you look at the body, which is put into the grave uh, on the predella, on the lower part of the altar, this is suffering. And the two saints, St. Sebastian and St. Anthony, they are the saints protecting the sick. In different uh, circumstances, it's always when the two are there, and we will talk about that. St. Sebastian is the saint protecting you from the plague, and St. Anthony will talk about this in a moment. So we open the altar, because it becomes even more glamorous. And as I said, this is mostly during uh, the year when there is a big feast. And here we see uh, St. Mary. On the left-hand side, we see the Annunciation. The angel is coming into her room and uh, she is sitting there and on, in the middle part, she is giving, has been giving birth, and uh, there is an angel's concert. So this is triumph and a wonderful start. And then all the time, we are reminded that this will not end well when the young child is put into the grave down there. But then on the right-hand side, you see the flamboyant <laughs> resurrection. And this is not only Christ leaving the grave, but directly going to heaven. For those of you who have been in the museum and have been looking at uh, Renaissance, uh, Renaissance art, it is obvious that these are wonderful examples of Renaissance art. And we are looking at one of the, if not the best, example of Northern Renaissance, 1516 or 1512 to 1516. That's These are the same years that Raphael was painting in the Vatican. These are the same years Michelangelo is painting the Sistine Chapel. And in Germany, in Colmar, uh, Matthias Grunewald is uh, painting this piece. I show you some details from that and you can see how naturalistic the painting is. Uh, you can see when you look on the left hand side, uh, this is where Christ just has been washed, taken out by his mother on the right hand side. She's holding the child. You can see this wonderful piece of glass up there, and you can see the towels and everything. So this reminds us not only of the quality of the painting by Grunewald and most likely his pupils, although we don't know who has been his assistants during that time, but it reminds us also at the same time about the human nature of Jesus Christ, which is expressed here. And then on the right-hand side, as I already mentioned, you see this soldier lying down there, and uh, you can easily recognize the artistry uh, of how wonderful Grunewald has painted this foreshortening of uh, the knight who is uh, the soldier who is lying down there, and the colors behind Christ and uh, who and how the resurrection is displayed has been famous forever. This combination of colors has not have not has not been seen before. And then that's not all of it. We can go to the next level. And the next level, we change the medium. You open the wings for uh, the third view. And what you see are carvings and carvings gilded in gold together with paintings. 
So the carvings were done by an artist from Freiburg. Hagenau was the name. And you can see in the middle St. Anthony. Easy to recognize because you have the split beard. So he is the most important saint in that. And uh, he is accompanied by the donors. These are the small um, in uh, dark brown and their specific saints. And down below, you have Jesus Christ and the disciples. We will mostly talk about these two wing paintings. On the left-hand side, you see uh, St. Anthony visiting St. Paul, the hermit, in the desert. It's not really a desert. You can see a palm tree, and they're sitting together. Uh, St. Paul, the hermit, is clad into a uh, palm. And there is a bird flying there, a little bit difficult to see, and the bird is throwing a piece of bread into the hand of St. Paul the hermit. On the right-hand side, it's much more traumatic. It's much more expressive. Here you see one clan <clears throat> that uh, these are very unpleasant animals there. Looks very dangerous. And when you look more carefully, you see uh, St. Anthony with a split beard torn apart. And this is what is known as the temptation uh, and the suffering of St. Anthony. So this is, these are the three views of the Isnaham altar. And as I said, we'll concentrate on these two wings here, and especially on the right-hand side, because on that side, we have ischemia, We'll talk about this in a minute. And we have hallucinations. So this is not only the imagination. I can already tell you that of the artist. He means something by depicting all um, these animals there. But before we go there, and we'll talk about the big machine of images and imagination. And I've put together here all three views so this gives you an impression how impressive this was uh, at a time when there was no video and uh, when you went to church, you should actually pray. But what people did is they sat there and they watched in admiration uh, the altar. So we have both sides. And it's easy when you look at that to understand why the Protestant movement, which started two years after that, when Martin Luther uh, first claimed that Protestantism is the better religion, you can easily understand why the Protestants during the first wave enthusiastically threw all these paintings out of churches, get rid of this richness of uh, displaying color uh, and life. A few words about the painter, Matthias Grunewald. We are not 100% sure about uh, how he actually was pronounced. So there is Matthias, Matthias. Um, he was born most likely around 1475, 1480 in Würzburg. This is Southern Germany and he died 1528 in Halle. These were exciting times. I already mentioned the beginning of the Reformation, the beginning, beginning of Protestantism, uh, shortly followed by what we call in Europe the Peasants' War, when the peasants went into revolution because uh, they wanted to have better conditions. And Matthias Grunewald was working during that time and he was actually involved in all that. He became Protestant. He was supporting the peasants during their revolt, which led to problems in his personal life. He was famous already. I show you here uh, uh, 
three paintings. And uh, these painters are mentioned by Melanchthon when he wrote about painting in Germany. And for him, there was Dürer, there was Lukas Grana, and there was Matthias Grünewald. And he said, Dürer paints in a grandiose manner. And you can see here the four apostles, famous. Uh, and you can see Lukas Granach. And he said, this is simple and graceful. And Matthias Grünewald keeps the balance. I don't know whether you really would believe that this is a balance painting, but you see here in more detail what I described before with the colors, which are new with the foreshortenings and the artistry of the way he painted the bodies and the figures in the altar. He lived at about the same time as Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo was born 1452, so 20 years difference, uh, died 10 years earlier. But this is not the only comparison between the two. When you look at their job descriptions, what they actually did, they were involved in engineering, in water and fireplaces. We know about Matthias Grünewald, that he was involved in one lawsuit because one of the fireplaces he had built in Würzburg didn't work that well. They were involved in Windcraft, mills and flight, army. Matthias Grünewald was working on defenses also in Würzburg. Uh, we don't know about sculpture, but we know about Leonardo. And then they did painting. And I always find it very interesting that when we look at that, it's so hard to understand the 16th century because when Leonardo was actually applying for a job in Milan, painting was mentioned last. He first said, I'm a musician. I can play the flute so well, you will be delighted. And I can enjoy a whole party with my chokes and uh, my riddles. And then at last, he was talking about painting. And Matthias Grünewald also was involved, as I already mentioned, in all sorts of activities, and painting was just one of them. So this is a theme during our lecture series. We'll come back to that, because when we talk about science and how science occurred and how scientists first uh, came uh, into existence, really, this is a very interesting uh, area because at the moment, even in our science, there are different job descriptions. The job descriptions are changing. And uh, so this is an interesting link when we look at the painters at that time. So we're coming back to our painting. We're coming back to the right wing of the third view uh, with the animals. And uh, we are concentrating now on the left-hand side on a human being, but definitely somebody who is suffering. So here, this is our starting point with disease. And what we see here uh, is somebody in agony. So mostly naked, with definitely skin disease, a lot of inflammation, swollen belly, very dark skin, dark, especially when you look at the ex extremities. And what I find very interesting, the more you look and the more you watch and the more you go into the details, you see on the one hand, the agony and the pain, because the patient, if we would call him patient, is tearing out from a book. But at the same time, the extremities, both the hand, at least the left hand and the right foot, they end in, in they are frog-like. Uh, frog -like. So this is very interesting. The painter is not only painting what he sees, the painter is also painting an 
sensation and the sensation obviously when you look at this and it, look at these frog feet is coldness so we have dark tissue we have inflamed tissue it's painful and the extremities are cold and this is obviously ischemia so we have a patient with ascites we have a patient who has a painful condition with ischemia in the legs and the arms in the extremities. So what is this disease? Here you see it in more detail. It looks horrible and dangerous. This patient in the um, emergency room provides, gives you a headache and problems. So the body is discolored is black and blue, the bloated abdomen covered with blisters. You have abscesses, the extremities are atrophic and the patient is in agony. Now this condition has been described by others at the time and before. This is a description of this disease from 1098. That's a thousand years old and what this Siegbert de Chambleau, a Benetting monk, wrote is the intestines eaten up by the force, and here we have the name of the disease of St. Anthony's fire, and now you understand why St. Anthony is so prominent in this altar, with ravaged limbs, blackened like charcoal. Either the patients die miserably or they live more miserably, seeing their feet and hands develop gangrene and separate from the rest of the body, and they suffer muscular spasms that deform them. Many of them experience nervous cramps and terrible hallucinations. So in addition to the cold extremities, we can now appreciate uh, that there are hallucinations also painted, as you can see here. So this is elegant. The painter is not only realistically, which he does very well, painting what he sees, but he's also describing the hallucinations of our patient. And everybody who has experienced the disease can immediately relate to what's displayed here. And even more elegantly, he adds this description of the disease to the story of St. Anthony. I've told you about the temptation of St. Anthony and that's part of that. And uh, when you look more closely, you can see in the back, uh, this ruinous building, there is fire in there. So he's not only displaying the, our patient, the hallucinations, but also the fire and you remember that the disease is called St. Anthony's fire. So all in one painting on this wonderful altar. The disease is called ergotism. And ergot is a fungal disease that affects many grasses, uh, particularly rye. And the infection is by the parasitic organism Claviceps purpura. The disease has been known as you just saw for a thousand years and longer. The ideology was first described by a Dr. Tullier in 1630. He was a doctor in France, working for the Duke of Sully. He described the association between the clinical pictures and the ingestion of ergot. He found, and others have been descri have described this before, that it has to do with climate. So it's more common in wet and cold climate and uh, it occurs mostly by the poor. This is a theme the New England Journal uh, is uh, talking about a lot these days. Diseases are uh, about the causes of diseases and uh, that it has to do with climate and it has to do with income. It was common. After my talk, when you go to the museum, you can see patients who have survived the acute 
face of Hercules. On the left hand side, Hieronymus Boss, and on the right hand side, Peter Breuger. And that's just one example. There are really dozens of them when you walk through galleries with open eyes. One example, another St. Anthony uh, altar is from Hieronymus Bosch, famous for uh, all the hallucinations. And part of it is explained by the hallucinations of St. Anthony's fire. And you see the same elements I've just described. Uh, you see in the back, a burning building indicating the fire in the extremities. Ironically, the building which is burning here is uh, the monastery of St. Anthony uh, in Hieronymus Bosch's hometown. When you look more closely here, and we won't go into details, uh, and you concentrate on the center, you see this uh, man in red with a dark head. This is a little bit more enlarged, and uh, this man is sitting there and contemplating and looking in the center at one of the blackened feet, which has fallen off from a patient. Perhaps he was the patient. We don't know. So that's a very modern version of describing the disease we are talking about. The alkaloids which are causing the symptoms and the disease are they were derived from ergot and they were the first drugs isolated and produced. The company was Sandos, now Novartis in Basel and Switzerland. And you can see here that the uh, compounds which come out of the ergot, uh, they lead to smooth muscle contraction, uh, they are inhibitors of transmitter release. So the smooth muscle contraction explains the ischemia. The transmitter uh, release uh, has to do with the hallucination. You can use this in different conditions, and it is used today. This shows you one famous chemist. He was running the lab laboratory at Sandoz. This is Dr. Albert Hoffmann. And Hoffman uh, was famous for uh, his getting drugs out of ergots. And uh, one drug, especially, he found, you can see this on the left-hand side, is LSD. So that's an alkaloid coming out. And this explains, as I said, the hallucinations. He then became famous. He, he was very old, but you can imagine... Uh, in his 80s, when then one of his uh, products, LSD, became very famous. Uh, and you see him on the left-hand side with another pharmacologist with the long hair. That's Timothy Leary. And uh, lots of posters. And uh, he enjoyed that, actually. Before I go back to the altar, this is a letter from Albert Hoffman. He wrote when he was 100 and one years old. You can see this, it's uh, uh, written to dear Mr. Stephen Charles. Hello from Albert Hoffman. I understand from media accounts that you feel LSD helped you creatively in your development of Apple computers and your personal spiritual quest I'm interested in. We never know whether Steve Jobs wrote back most likely he did. So we go back to the altar in Eastenheim. So this is the first view. And the question is, what has it to do with Eisenheim? And uh, for whom was it made? And who made the concept of this altarpiece? Now, the Antonites in Eisenheim, this was a monastery the Antonites are an order. It was a monastery and a hospital. Actually, the Antonites, uh, they are an order for one disease. They were founded in the 1100s. And you can see very nicely St. Anthony here with the split beard. And he is surrounded 
by patients with the one disease. This gives an idea how common the disease was the Antonites took care of. So you can see here another example how the burning of the extremities is uh, displayed by the artist. Uh, both hands on both uh, in both sketches are uh, on fire. And you can see the fallen off uh, legs on the left hand side. Now, what did they do? How did they treat the disease and how did they diagnose the disease? And I go with you through this and I show you examples because the beginning of it all, as always in medicine, is the diagnosis. So the diagnosis, holy fire or St. Anthony's fire had to be made. There were diagnostic criteria. They were not taking blood and doing lab work, but uh, they had clear criteria and without a proper diagnosis, no hospital admission. If you had another disease, this was not the hospital you would go to. So the differential diagnosis included skin effect infections, the plague, gangrene, intoxications, other intoxications, syphilis after 1500, epilepsy, and psychosis. So you needed doctors, experienced doctors there, and we have letters where the monks of Isenheim actually sent patients back explaining that they had another diagnosis and this was not St. Anthony's fire. And then they had therapeutic strategies. I'll come to this in a moment, but first let me explain a little bit the hospital structure around 1500. This is not a big city in the south of Germany. It's uh, called Memmingen. Uh, this, these days it's more a provincial town, at the time, around 1500, it was not that small, but definitely not a capital. And what you can see here, that during the 16th century, there were eight hospitals in this small city. And these eight hospitals, they were very specific. So number eight, you can see on this map, is the hospital of the Antonites. So this was only for patients with the disease. And all the others were specialized. I mean, some were for the poor and some were for the chronic ill uh, patients, but they all had a structure. And this map shows you, this is um, Central Europe. All the dots here are hospitals of the Antonines order. They were centrally organized the center was in Saint Antoine. So all the SOPs for the different hospitals were generated in Saint Antoine and distributed. And there were clear rules for therapeutic approaches and strategies. And the therapies and the therapeutic approaches were also displayed on the altar as you will see in a moment. So when the patients come in, the SOP was washing and cleaning, which is understood. Change of diet, already directly directed at uh, the cause of the disease. And they didn't know about the uh, ergot, but they changed the diet. Wheat instead of rye, because it's more common in rye. They treated them with St. Anthony's wine diluted red wine with herbs for vasodilation. And then very interestingly, meditation in front of the altar during the first night. So that's a very modern concept of how you use psychosomatic, uh, how you treat uh, psychologically the disease. And when we look at that, what it meant is that the sick were put in front of the altar. And when you are in pain and you look at this and you meditate, not only that you can be sol uh, uh, saved by religion, but also that Jesus Christ is more suffering than you. So the expressionist's hands 
I've described and uh, the very detailed, you can see this here, the very detailed description of the agony of Christ. Here you see this in detail. And the body I think this helped to understand that you're not alone with in your diseased state. And you could also see the same, and I've mentioned this before in the second opening. Now, this was common, a common theme for hospitals during that time. I'm just showing you very briefly another example. This is Rogier van der Weyden, that's the altarpiece in Bonn, that's in Burgundy, <clears throat> painted in 1443. And uh, the donor was uh, a famous person in Burgundy, the minister Roland. And here you can see that the painting was directly displayed. In Bonn, we still have the original hospital beds. And uh, this is famous when you go there, most people visit that. And the painting is directly uh, on the wall where the sick were treated. So as I said, it was about religion. Sure, it was about saving your soul, but it was also <laughs> telling you that other people are suffering as well. So then <clears throat> the next step, was the concrete and the hallucination. But first, the gangrene. So I have shown you that, that, whoop, excuse me, that in the end, if the legs and the hands didn't fall off by themselves, they had to be am amputated. And the Antonites had a very famous surgeon nearby, the Antonites in Colmar. This was Hans von Gerstorff. Hans von Gerstorff is one of the famous surgeons in the 16th century. This is the textbook he wrote, which is the Feldbuch der Wundarztei. And on the right-hand side, you see one example. So he came to Colmar, which is only a short trip from Strasbourg, two times per week. And we have the contract, how much he was paid for that. So it was a very modern organization. And this is what we can see. A role model, how you interact with surgeons, you hire them for uh, two afternoons per week because you don't need them all the time. Just historically interesting, the textbooks, surgical, surgical textbooks at that time, this one is from 1363, 3,000 citations, more than 100 authors. So it's very much like the textbooks we have today. And then last not least, they used herbs. St. Anthony's balm, and also in the red wine, they had herbs for vasodilation. And do we know anything? Is there anything on the altar, yes, there is. You can see, and this is more like PR for the bomb because to be honest, we know from the 18th century, they sold it for quite a bit of money. So here you can see the bomb, which is used actually for Jesus Christ, but nonetheless, it already reminds you of what you can get when you're a patient in the hospital. Interestingly, for centuries, this was uh, the recipe had been lost and has only been found a couple of years ago in an old book. So we know now how the Antonite bomb was made four pounds of tallow, four pounds of lard, uh, four pounds of whipped pork lard. And then we have different herbs which go into this. And it heals the wounds but it's also basal relaxant and uh, people have been looking into this more in detail. Excuse me. So 
there are herbs on the painting, in the painting. And I think this is very interesting. When you look more closely, you can see this on the left-hand side where the saints are sitting. So the healing power is not so much on the side where the hallucination was, but where it's more quiet. So the therapeutic tools are displayed in the altar. And this has been researched on. To be honest, I'm not the expert here. So for me, it would have been very hard. But here you see uh, in magnification, the herbs which are there. And St. Anthony is sitting actually next to verbena, buckhorn, lambsfoot, the long-headed poppy, Austrian speedwell, white clover, and the whole book of what you need in order to prepare uh, the lotion. So we have here uh, on the altar, not only a very interesting description of the disease on the different levels of the disease from uh, the patient himself and the hallucinations and the fire, but we also have the therapeutic approach. We have the herbs. And last but least, we have religion there helping you in your miserable condition. And we are very much interested in science and the herbs are science. They're a scientific object. And one of the questions I had when I was looking at the altar, how did they do that and where does this come from that they went out there and painted these herbs? I've told you that Matthias Grunewald was doing lots of things, building fireplaces and uh, was an engineer. But did he actually go out there? Or was it the monks and they went out there? But when we look at the literature before Grunewald, this is relatively crude. However, as you know, during the Renaissance, and the one, most wonderful example is on the left-hand side, Albrecht Dürer, the big turf, where the Renaissance artist did a wonderful job in painting grass. We can also differentiate the different herbs which are uh, painted here. And I think we all can do this the question is why? Why was he using all his artistry to build a realistic painting of nature? And you can easily see that Grunewald was as good as Dürer in doing this on this altar. When we look more closely into that, and these are other examples from Dürer, 1526, 1503. When we look more closely into what other painters did, uh, we find for the first time realistic paintings in books, which helps you to understand plants and understands you Materia Medica. And these books, here is Kontrafeit Kreuterbuch. This was edited in Strasbourg, not that far. Admittedly, 16 years later. And uh, the woodcuts were from Hans Weitlitz, who had actually trained with Dürer. The book, himself, uh, the book itself was written by a Dr. Brunfeld. And I'll talk about this in a moment. Here you see how wonderfully the different herbs we see in the painting are appearing in the book. And since the book was edited later, the question is where still, where did uh, Matthias Grunewald get the examples from? Very interestingly, uh, Otto Brunfels, who was the author of the book, so together with Weitlitz and with others, he worked on this book and his first book appeared in Latin in 1532 and immediately a second edition in German. And here you see very nicely how comparable this is. Now, interestingly, Brunfels 
was working near Strasbourg starting in 1518. So this tells you that there were uh, scientists, question mark, already there editing these books. And they added text to it. So this is uh, not the first time, but that text was there, but it's the first time that we have these herbs displayed with such a high quality. When you look carefully, you see that it's not only the leaves, it's a description of the whole plant, especially with everything which is below the surface also. And it's very artfully done. And with that starts a big discussion, which is a scientific discussion. Is it more important to have an illustration or is the text better? This was an ongoing discussion in the 16th century about these books. I personally think you need both, but the relationship between the text and the graphics are very interesting. I just photographed that out of the catalog because as we speak, there is a very nice exhibition of these herbal books in the Pierpoint Morgan Library in New York City uh, with a, a very nice sample of herbal books from the 16th century. So it's exactly our topic at the moment. And this is what Otto Brunfeld's book looked like, the Kontrafeit Kreuterbuch uh, with the graphical work by Weitlitz, and this shows you the title page. And this is uh, then the first edition uh, in Latin with an introduction. And this is then further on, Hans Weitlitz again. And here you can see how artful this is done. And here, this discussion about text and graphics is obvious. And last not least, it was now a group of people working together. This is like our concept in the lab. Even at that time, it was not an isolated figure like uh, Otto Brunfeld, and he had Hans Weidlitz, but he needed more than that. And here you can see three others and they are depicted in the book as well. So you have your co-authors actually very prominently in these books. The one who made the drawings, the one who made the woodcuts, and the one uh, second woodcutter uh, and printer of the book. The driving force behind all that, as you can uh, imagine, was the publisher because these herbal books were terribly successful uh, and sold very well. Some of these books had 18 editions within a hundred years and were bestsellers. So I'll give you a couple of examples uh, of what these books looked like and how many of these books were written this is Wrestling in 1540. This is uh, book 1546. This is Hieronymus Bock in uh, 1560. This is a very interesting example because it's the last book where medicine or the medical properties of these herbs are prominently described. After that, the medical books and the botanical books uh, went different ways. After Hieronymus Bock, there was not a lot of medical description. And for the remainder of the 16th century, we have now botanical descriptions and organization of plants. Because at the same time, the number of plants in these books went from 300, around 1500, to more than 3000, 100 years later. This had to do with the discoveries uh, in the world and book uh, and uh, plants brought back. And with that, I'd like to finish. I think we went 
and had a long journey through this fascinating altar. I think we all appreciate that there was a lot to look at and there was a lot to think about when you were sitting in front of this. It is obvious that not everybody was grasping everything, so we have different levels of understanding and we know this about art at that time, but nonetheless, it's a very powerful instrument and it tells you a lot about images and imagination, but also about science and medicine. With that, thank you very much for your attention. I honestly can look at this even after preparing the talk forever. Thank you for joining us. Dr. Haller, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. What an amazing, it was a packed lecture, so many different um, facets that I, I really hadn't envisioned. So it's really, really wonderful. If you don't mind um, maybe taking your share screen off, I think we're a small enough group that we can just open it up. I see Alan has his hand raised. We'll call on him in a second, but maybe there we go. Um, and if others have questions, if you want to use the raise hand feature, it'll help because you'll all be, you'll come to the, the first screen um, here and that would be great. But Alan, go ahead if you have a question. Yes. Uh, thank you for a great talk. I learned a lot and I'll, I guess one comment I have is next time I'm in the hospital, should I hang a nice picture over my bed <laughs> that might work for me? But the real question is on the herbals, those books. I think what happened is the age of exploration in the 1500s brought many, many more plants to Europe. And I know, for instance, in Holland, they had special gardens where they would try to grow these things that they brought in from the voyages, also in England. But was there something like that in Germany? Because you show these books from German authors. And was Germany involved in getting access to plants that were coming from the New World from all these other countries? Well, definitely. I mean, uh, the first gardens uh, in Germany, even before the Dutch examples, to be honest, uh, the first garden in the Netherlands was Leiden in 1580. And Heidelberg uh, had uh, a, a, an educational garden before that. The first scientific garden, I have to admit, was in Leiden. And uh, we'll work on that uh, next year when we will we plan an exhibition on science and the garden, but uh, it's exactly as you described it. There were new plants coming in. The most famous example is the tulip. The tulip was not present in Europe and it was introduced from Constantinople uh, only in the 1520s. And then it became so famous in the Netherlands that it became uh, basically a Dutch uh, plant and a Dutch flower. But there were gardens all over Europe, uh, the Italians also very early on. And uh, these are very interesting developments from Renaissance gardens in Florence and uh, around Siena, then turning into scientific gardens, both for medicine, but also for botany and an interest in understanding flowers and insects. So Germany played a role there and you can see it's all about trade routes and the trade <laughs> routes went through Nuremberg in Germany and they went uh, down mm -hmm. the Rhine Valley. So this is why we have so many uh, book editions and so much science there. Good, thank you. Dr. Boyer, do you have a question? Oh uh, yes, uh, thank you Herman for this is really exciting talk. Uh, uh, but it raises the question how far back one can go to find uh, paintings of these herbs, um, particularly in what influenced the Chinese, uh, the Ayurvedic um, medical uh, history can provide, because that goes even way, way uh, yeah. back in terms of history. Yeah. So first, uh, the paintings. I mean, we can have a uh, hundred years earlier, uh, at the end of the 14th century, actually, we have recognizable flowers in uh, paintings. Uh, there is Pisanello comes to mind, painting in Italy, 
uh, but they were more abstract. They were not naturalistic. There is really a major change around 1500. And the examples I've shown you are really the first ones where we have a realistic, naturalistic painting of these plants. Before that, it was more rough. Uh, it was not recognizable. So the examples you have seen is really a point in history where all of a sudden we can look at these herbs now and we can identify something. And 40 years before that, you couldn't do that. Now, this has a lot to do with book printing. You know, you had when you when you had just one book and you were doing these drawings and you had the text, this is different from mass production. And these books were actually printed by the thousands at that time. Uh, in fact, the first pocket books in the 16th century were herbal books. There's a very famous little herbal which was printed in London in 1525 and was printed and reprinted till the 1900s. Now, the question with China, with China is a very interesting one. Uh, we don't have a lot of influence in, in, in graphical art from China. We have some influence from Constantinople and from, uh, uh, the, from the East, but the influence with herbs, uh, this goes back far beyond 1500. So we had the Silk Road going into Europe and we had herbs coming in from there and we had uh, all the herbs coming in from India versus the uh, via the Mediterranean through Venice. Uh, so there was a rich trade and a lot of knowledge about herbs, but the graphical display, this only started around 1500. Thank you. <laughs> Other questions for Dr. Haller? It's fascinating. Dr. Haller, thank you so much for such a, just an informative lecture. Really, I love going in deep and seeing all the detail in that painting. It was in the, in the um, altar. It was just amazing. So thank you for that. So one, about one month from now, we will have um, our second art and science lecture for 2024. And Dr. Howard, do you want to give a little promo for that as we talk about the travels of uh, Albert Durer? Yeah. So you have seen a wonderful example of Durer's art already with the big turf. And uh, Durer uh, acquired a disease in 1523, which was characterized by a high spiking fever of uh, and uh, headaches, and uh, we'll talk about that. We'll do a differential diagnosis. He actually made a small painting, of, well, not painting, he made a sketch of that for his doctor, I think, where he described very nicely what's on it. And we'll use that then to make a differential diagnosis. And this means we have to look in his, into his personal history and we'll do that. And we will look into his travels. And uh, this will give us then a rich picture of uh, the most famous artist in uh, Europe at that time and what he did and what he thought about uh, not only art, but also science, because uh, he made it very clear, all his paintings, that was interesting, but the real purpose of his work was science and to find uh, what's really behind all these phenomena, phenomena. And we'll talk about this in four weeks. That's great. So February 28th. And before we leave, Dr. Haller, I'm wondering if you might um, introduce our 2024 artists in residence to the audience. I see Michael here um, with us with his camera on. Do you want to just give a little talk about what's to come and, and some of the plans that you have for our exhibit in the coming year? Well, that's uh, a difficult question. Hello, Michael. <laughs> uh Great to see you. Uh, to be honest, I'm afraid of artists. You know, I mean, they are so much better than and more interesting than what we do. So um, having an artist in residence actually means is that we talk to each other. We try, I try to explain what I think about MDIBL and about our science. And uh, then we're waiting for him. No pressure, Michael. We're waiting for him to transform this miraculously <laughs> into interesting art. We have an example of his art already uh, 
on the wall in MCVI. And uh, there his art is sitting next to a video screen from uh, science from Prayag Moravala's lab. And uh, I think your art piece of art is called The Four Riders of the Apocalypse. There, mm -hmm. is, there is Albrecht Dürer again. <laughs> and uh, we are looking forward to interesting discussions. Uh, our faculty is looking forward to another look at our science and uh, the way we produce our knowledge and then display it. And the way Michael is doing this, this will be interesting. I mean, Michael will talk to you about uh, where he comes from. And uh, he already has experience as an artist in residence. He worked with the, he was an artist in residence with the British Library. So it will be very interesting to see what he, no pressure, as I said, what he makes out of MDIBL. Well, I'm really looking forward to it, Dr. Haller. And um, and I've really enjoyed sort of not only this lecture, but I, I was uh, able through uh, Emily to uh, watch some of the lectures you've given in the past. And it's uh, it's already, stimulated my imagination and thinking about things. And, and tonight's lecture, what I particularly enjoyed is um, the idea of the, the art using technology, representing technology, bringing the science together um, in this idea of the machine. And I'm, I'm looking forward to being there uh, in, in about a week's time and uh, exploring the your, your site in depth and um, seeing the work that you do, the technology you use, and also the concepts and the in the ways and the met methodologies and sort of the processes you take in your explorations. I, you know, I absolutely agree. I think art and science are very close together and um, in, in what we do and why we do it. Wonderful. Okay. journey. Yes, it will be an exciting journey. And we're so happy that all of you will be joining us. It certainly will not be, this may be the first time you heard from Michael, but it won't be the last. We're really excited to sort of watch this journey. And as all of you know, we like to do a lot of exper experiments here at MDIBL. And this is a bit of, ex of an experiment in and of itself. And so we're anxious to hear your feedback as we work through this process over the next year and invite Michael to come and take a closer look at some of the work that's happening here at the MDI Biolab. And and then be able to share that with all of you and, and with the public. So thank you all so much for being here with us this evening. Thank you to Dr. Haller for such a great lecture. And Michael, more to come. We look forward to uh, engaging with you over the, over the coming year. So we'll see you next month, uh, February 28th, again at 5 o'clock. We'll send the recording of this um, lecture to all of you next week. And if you'd like to share it with others that you think would be interested in our art and science initiative, please do so. We would uh, love to spread the word and have more people um, participate and get involved. So thank you all so much. And we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. <laughs>